season two, week two of The Corp. Hopefully you listen to Stephanie McMahon and Triple H. This interview, though, with Mark Mastrov, who is the chairman CEO of 24 Hour Fitness. Great interview. Someone you might not know about. And that's kind of what we've been trying to do with season two of The Corp. We're finding people you, maybe household names, and then people you don't know about and telling their stories. Because a lot of people who listen to this are interested in business, maybe young people who want to get in the world of business and hearing stories of entrepreneurs is always important. So Mark Mastrov, chairman, CEO of 24 Hour Fitness. He also is partial owner of the Kings. Fitness revolution. This is the weird thing, A-Rod, that I think our younger listeners, and I probably am the same way, don't realize is in the 90s, in the early 90s, in the 80s, there were no gyms at every corner, right? That's right. That's right. It was completely different, and you had a guy like Mark Mastroff basically revolutionize the gym space. Do you remember the first gym that you uh, like? You know, had a membership to? Yeah, and it was probably like a Gold's Gym or something in Miami, right? Right. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about Mark Mastroff is uh, he's been a, a great friend and a mentor of mine. But, you know, he was doing what we consider cool today. Everyone wants to be in the space of health and wellness. He was doing it in the late 70s. Here's a guy that's built multiple billion-dollar companies um, with a, from a $30,000 loan from his grandmother. And he took that, skipped business school, and said, I'm going to start with one gym. Grew it to over f- almost 500 gyms. Sold in 2008 for $1.8 billion to Ted Forsham before he passed. And now has gone on to do UFC. He just sold Crunch to TPG, the private equity group. Mm-hmm. And is doing partnerships with the NFL, NFL Fit, 49ers Fit, Cowboys Fit. And he is a serial entrepreneur. And I think you'll learn as many lessons from Mark Mashall on this pod than any we've done before. Okay, so the question, I'm actually going to say it's the LinkedIn question because LinkedIn's a great sponsor. Go check them out right now. Uh, you can go linkedin.com slash the corp. The question I ask in the start of every show because I want to give people something a little different. Mark Mashroff, we talked to him about being a partial owner of the Kings. He was maybe looking to be a part of the Warriors mm-hmm. ownership group. Alex Rodriguez, when are we owning a team? <laughs> I own two teams. I own Swansea and the New Zealand Breakers. But when are you and I owning a baseball team? Seriously, though. Yeah. Are you going to ever do it? You know, we own NRG Esports out of San Francisco. Doesn't count. Doesn't count. That's kind of um, humble. Yeah. I actually own I own a, a team. I don't even know what the name of them, the uh, esports team as well out of New Zealand. Yeah. Don't know the name. But. You own a fantasy football team. Also that. Yeah. Uh, but no, seriously, you, in, in all seriousness, you have been linked to maybe being a partial owner of a baseball team. Do you ever think that you will want to do that? I think um, that can be a possibility. I, I've learned never to say never. And I've looked at several teams very quickly. And, you know, things are very expensive right now. And I think when the opportunity comes, um, I'm going to have to devote 100% of my time to running a team. I don't think it's something that you can do part time. Mm-hmm. And I think where I bring the most value is to be oversee the business and the baseball operations and put an A-plus team around me to do that. And it takes a lot. It's not something you can do part-time. Okay. So when you do, because that sounded like a yes, (laughs) uh, when you were getting headlines here, (laughs) when you do own a team, um, can you hire me to just be, I'm not saying a coach, but kind of a general glue guy. Like, I'm just around, and I can hang out or not hang out. You know, one of those guys. I feel like you need one. No. Okay. Well, that was a bet. That I have just put a curse on your future team. <laughs> You'll never win a World Series. Boom. You know the saying, Dan? They say, uh, first time, your fault. Second time, my fault. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's true. That's true. You got to run the corp. You're doing great here. Yeah, yeah. We got to run the corp. I got to run the corp, and, and maybe maybe someday you'll soften on it, and you'll realize, you know what? That is the glue. I, I do have a question for you. If you yeah. can – if you're you're like the sport icon follower of the world, right? You're Mr. Twitter and all of that. No one watches more sports than you. If you can own one team mm. and you won the lottery for ten mm. billion dollars, you can pay cash. And I say ten billion because the Cowboys they say now are worth ten billion. So I'm I'm letting you cover the whole thing, from Cowboys to who would you? Oh man, that's tough. I would close in thirty days. I would probably say as much as I love football, I 
I don't know how that would work out in the future. I mean, there are some s- people can say like, oh, yeah, well, we don't know what football is going to be in 30 years. I didn't ask you that. I said, okay. which team? I'm telling you. I'm telling you because my knee-jerk reaction is Chicago Bears. Ooh. But I think I would buy the Chicago Bulls and save the city of Chicago from what has gone on. I would, I would hire Gar Foreman and John Paxson just so I could fire them every single day. I'd hire wow. him in the morning, fire him at night. That's interesting. And just do that all the time and just win back, uh, you know, maybe get, bring Michael Jordan back in. Maybe he could play probably. Probably, right yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Have him play and do that whole thing, win like, I don't know, 15 championships. And what That's kind of owner would you be? Would you be on the court? Oh, hands on. Like, like, I'd probably play. Like Robert Kraft or yeah, yeah. more involved? I'd go in and, and foul a couple times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I would be all, listen, if you see Mark Cuban getting involved, I yeah. would really be involved. Okay. I'd I be like on that. the court. Uh, yeah, Great. so there's my answer, okay, final answer. The Bears, and you I would like buy Bears. the Yankees. I mean, you, of course, but, you know, Howe would never sell it. I, uh, I advise Howe. Howe's a great friend, and, and, yeah, I mean, the Yankees would be the, the ultimate for sure. Couldn't you just advise him to sell it? <laughs> I, I think I just cracked the case there, <laughs> That's right? Good. And then you That's just good. swoop in like, hey, I, got a, I have a buyer. You know, I didn't go to college. You're thinking much faster than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get to the interview, our friends from LinkedIn – We are going to get some people, some jobs just from listening to this episode. So if you are an employer, you need to be on LinkedIn. And if you're an employee or someone who's looking for a new job, you need to be on LinkedIn because we, Barstool Sports, have a bunch of uh, job listings on LinkedIn. We're looking for candidates all the time. If you're not on there, we're not going to find you. You're never going to work here. And the Corp also. The Corp, A-Rod Corp hires all the time from there. I'm actually looking for an executive assistant right now. Mm-hmm. So if you're uh, looking for a job, call Jeff Lee. He'll find you. Yes, you got to get on LinkedIn. Get Make sure your resume, your everything is up to date. Make sure all your, all your connections are up to date because that's really how people get found now. You, yeah. can't, you can't get a job at the Corp like I did by stalking you on Twitter. That is a thing of the past. We're only doing LinkedIn, right? <laughs> that's right. right. Every day I look at LinkedIn because that's where the best talent lives. That's where we recruit. LinkedIn is amazing. And that's a perfect uh, way to put it because if you are, if you own a business, if you're looking to hire and you're not on LinkedIn looking for candidates, you're not going to find the right candidates because LinkedIn has so many people looking for jobs, over 600 million members Visit LinkedIn to connect, learn, and grow as professionals and discover new job opportunities. Think about that. Think about 600 million people. You can hire someone from that pool. If you're not hiring from a huge pool, you're doing yourself a disservice. We just hire the first guy who incessantly tweets at you uh, randomly at 2 in the morning. You're doing yourself a disservice. (laughs) So LinkedIn is a way to do it if you want to make sure your job post is up to date, gets in front of people you want to hire people with the right hard and soft skills you're looking for you got to do it with linkedin because hiring isn't as simple as putting an ad in the paper or posting to a job board when you're juggling hiring with everything it takes to grow your business it's important that you reach the right candidates at the right time that's where linkedin comes in and a hire is made every eight seconds on linkedin so boom new hire boom new hire that was maybe less than eight seconds but you get the gist with linkedin jobs you can pay what you want and uh, the first $50 is on them. Just visit linkedin.com slash the corp. Again, that's linkedin.com slash the corp to get $50 off your first job post. So for all the employers out there, you're looking for new people, go to linkedin.com slash the corp to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. And if you want a job at Barstool, you want a job at the corp, go sign up to LinkedIn right now. Get that job because guess what? We just posted some new jobs right now. Boom. Right now, go sign up and get it on LinkedIn. Thank you to LinkedIn. Great sponsor. And now, Mark Mastroff. You're listening to The Corp, presented by Barstool Sports. So here we are, Mark Mastroff, the chairman, CEO of the founder of 24 Hour Fitness, uh, the best club around when I grew up. I know that that was the main thing, but Full transparency to all our listeners, Mark and I have been friends for about a dozen years. Um, we're partners in many different businesses and ventures, and uh, a, a very close friend, mentor, and someone who I admire a great deal. I mean, I know Mark, first of all, as for three things. Uh, number one, as a family man. He's got uh, his wife, Mindy, and four beautiful kids. Um, he's a sports fanatic. 
This guy loves sports more than anyone. He knows more sports than anyone I've ever met. And then obviously th three, what most people know you for is, is one of the greatest entrepreneurs uh, in the last many, many decades. So that's the full transparency is out there. Mark and I are friends. Mark, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about your childhood, born in Oakland, grew up in, in, in the Bay Area. Tell us a little bit about your basketball game and why you love sports so much. Uh, first, thanks for all the kind words. I'll get even <laughs> with you later on that. Um, if you step back, I grew up uh, in Oakland. You know, um, My dad played ball at Cal, and uh, he was a basketball guy. And when I grew up, I grew up in the gym. So my dad was a Brooklyn kid, and first generation out of Brooklyn, moved to uh, California, and then got a, a ride up to Cal to play basketball. And my dad was a guy that memorized statistics and sports and everything, so it kind of passed on to me. Uh, he's still a major fanatic, 84 years old. He watches every game, every team like crazy. Mm -hmm. He just loves sports. And so naturally, your son grows up the same way. And, uh, you know, we would sit there and look at stats and batting averages and, you know, free throw percentages and scoring titles and just always we're talking about the numbers. Mm. So uh, I want to first say that you have an impressive ability to you, – you're not online. So I looked for you all social media. Mm -hmm. That that actually kudos to you because most people you can if you Google them you can find like every little thing they ate for the breakfast and what their house looks like all that stuff. So with that, I I would love to hear just a backstory of how Twenty Four Hour Fitness started and you know how, you know how you d you know got it funded and what inspired you and, and just kind of the backstory for our entire audience. Yeah, sure. So I'll try and make it like less than a couple of minutes for you know, go hour, for as long as you want. Yeah, <laughs> but I. I, I uh, blew my knee out in college playing ball and rehabbed it. And when I rehabbed it, the, I remember the, the rehab guy told me, you're going to have to continue to keep your legs strong and, and lift weights around your legs and, and support your knee uh, for a long period of time. So when I graduated from college, I found this little gym near where I was living. And I walked in, and it was just getting ready to open. And I knew a kid that worked there I used to go to school with. And so he said, hey, you should work out here. So I went to buy a membership. I was pretty fit. The guy that owned the gym came over and grabbed me and says, hey, are you here for a trainer interview? And I'm like, no, I'm just here to buy a membership to stay in shape. He's like, well, look, I need trainers. Do you want a job here? I'm like, no, I got another job. He's like, well, look, work eight hours a week, free membership. I was like, well, I don't have a lot of money, so free membership sounds good. So I took the eight-hour-a-week job. I'd work like four hours on Wednesday nights and four hours on the weekends while I had another job. And kind of fell in love with the business. It was fun. It was exciting. It was uh, different. It was unique. And it was around health. And wellness. Now, I had no idea how to train somebody, no clue. They gave you a book called The Knowledge Principles. You read that and you were a certified trainer. And all I would do is probably blow out 400 million people's backs back in the day, <laughs> I'm sure, the stuff that I was doing. Uh, six months into it, I'd kind of navigated different functions in the business. And the guy comes to me and says, hey, look, I'm selling the club. A guy, a guy wants to buy it. I'm moving to L.A. I want you to come to L.A. and come work with me down there. I said, I'm, I'm not full-time in this business. I got another job. I'm not interested in going to L.A. I'm just staying here. He says, well, I thought you'd say that. The guy that is buying the club, he wants you to be the manager. I'm like, well, I appreciate that too, but I got another job. I don't really want to be the manager. So he introduced me to this guy, and, and we spent some time. He said, look, I want you to run the club. I said, I, I have another job. He said, I'll tell you, I'll make you a partner. And that got my attention. Mm. And he said, look, can you invest $15,000 at the time in this little gym? I didn't have $15,000. My mom and dad didn't, but my grandmother had a little bit of money. So I went to her and asked if I could borrow $15,000, and she let me. So I borrowed $15,000. I invested alongside this guy, and the rest is kind of history. went from there, and I can, I can tell you the next steps if you want. Yeah, Mark, no, Mark, no, tell it, us, yeah. first of all, tell us how Grandma Mass drove and, and how nervous you were. <laughs> yeah. Walk us through your pitch. Yeah. And, and how old were you at the time? <laughs> um, I'm 22, probably, okay. at that And time. gyms aren't big. Right, like no. at this point, what, what year is this? This is uh, eighty three. So, the, the, like, if you had to guess, how many gyms were in the city well, very, of Oakland? Very right? few. Most most gyms were in and out. You know, they'd come in, and there wasn't monthly dues. There wasn't electronic funds transfer. You basically came in, you, you pre sold, and either you made it or you didn't make it. And so, what ends up happening is a lot of people would open and close, and so I had a really bad reputation. Gyms were like a cloud over it. Right. And I remember going and telling friends, family, my girlfriend at the time, my mom and dad, I'm gonna I'm gonna quit my job. I had a pretty good job. I'm going to go run this little gym, 5,000 square foot gym. And they're like, you're freaking crazy. Yeah. And so, you know, I went after it. But I took this job and became a partner and, and basically learned everything from the beginning. But the guy who bought the gym wanted to build a software system. And so he can, I got to come back to Alex's answer too. But he, he, he basically said, look, we're going to design a system that runs gyms. 
And so what I did is I spent the next couple of years of the program writing at that time in DBase, and then what eventually became Unix, which was the platform of the time. And I learned how to really think about how to manage the business. And in a couple of years, we got that done, and then I started selling that software to gym operators. Mm. And what I found is most of them didn't know what the hell they were doing. If I went to them and said, hey, how's your business performing? They'd say, well, I mean, I'm making money. I'd say, well, what do your financials look like? They would hand me their bank statements with their checks that had been cashed. Mm -hmm. They had no clue. So coming back to Alex's question, so how did, how did I go to my grandmother? So my, my grandmother was pretty amazing. Um, my grandfather passed away very young. He passed away at 59. And so I kind of almost, when I got out of college, was kind of helping my grandmother kind of keep her life together, uh, managing what um, property they had owned, their home and their little businesses in Richmond and things that they had. And so I had a pretty good relationship with her. And so when I sat down with her, I was like, like I have this amazing opportunity and I, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to own my own business. It's a little early, but would you entrust me to borrow like $15,000? I really mm -hmm. think this could be amazing. And she was like, one second, boom, you got it. No problem. Wow. I believe in you. Go get it. Make it happen. So she's the the catalyst for allowing my dream to kind of come to the point of owning your own business at a very young age. I'd imagine you paid her back. Yeah, I paid her back with some nice interest. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, she was very happy, but she was more happy for the success. Yeah. You know? and, and, and she didn't get to see the full success, but she got to see a lot of the early days. And we had a lot of fun. So you go from this one 5,000 square foot gym, you're starting to work on the software behind it, how people run gyms. What's the next step? Where did you go from? I would imagine there's a next huge step that gets to 24 hour fitness. Yeah, so well, the, before that, yeah, Mark, sure. you told your sister, this is a great story because I know it, but I want you and our listeners to hear it just so you know how confident he was. He, talking to his sister, to Mark's sister, she tells me, yeah, Mark, everyone's thinking about going to B school. Obviously, he was really good with business. So is he going to go to business school? And he told his sister, well, uh, I'm not going to go to business school because I'm going to make my first million before 30, so I need to get to work. Is that accurate? That, yeah, it's probably <laughs> I mean, that, that was a goal. Like uh, in the 80s, if you made a million bucks, you, you thought you were pretty successful. Today, maybe you could put a down payment on a house with that. <laughs> but, but back in the day, that was like your target. You know, you wanted to make some money, and that, that put success in your, in your head. So, yeah. But you were just confident that being 22, that you had a runway – and, and, and a vision to get to where you wanted to go. Yeah, I was willing to work hard and, you know, put my, my head down and get after it. And I didn't have a problem working 20 hours a day, seven mm -hmm. days a week. It didn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, the tenacity you have in sports, right, just like you. Mm -hmm. I mean, you spent every waking minute to the point where if you lifted your head up, you, you didn't even know anything other than baseball mm -hmm. for a long time. And so anything you do in life, if you really give it 100% of your attention, all your time, energy, and effort, you're going to be successful. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now they coin it 10,000 hours, but yeah, yeah. to me yeah, it yeah. was like 10,000 days. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so in that time frame where you basically have your head down working 20 hours a day, what was the next step for the, for the gym's growth? Yeah, so great question. So you know, what ends up happening is, is that as we start selling the software, I start to recognize that I really don't like selling software. I really love the gym business. First of all, I'm a young guy, and 90% of the members are women. So I'm in there with all the women in the town. Wherever I went, I knew everybody. If I went to a nightclub, I knew every single person there, every female. The guys were like, how do you know all these girls? I said, well, they're members of the gym. Guys really didn't train that much in the early days, mostly women who set the trends. It's kind of the way it works. You know, the second piece was is I just loved the action of all the different things you could do. Probably my uh, ADHD, if they didn't coin it back in the day, I probably would have. I, I like to do a variety of things. And so you could do marketing, you could do accounting, you could do business, you could do acquisitions, you could do real estate, you know, customer service, sales, you had everything you could put your hat on in all facets of the business. And that was really attractive and fun. And then the, the other piece was that, you know, I, I just fell in love with the energy. And so I ended up not liking the software. So I go to the, my, my partner at the time and I said, look, why don't you take the software business and give me the gyms? So we cut a deal. He takes the, the software side of the house, and I take the gym side. And then I have a partner at the time who was our, kind of our CFO, and he comes and joins me on the gym side. His name is Leonard Schlem. And Leonard was a Harvard MBA out of um, you know, finance, super smart money guy. And so he and I kind of were the foundation of the business. And I worked the operations and pounded out every day, and he kind of handled the books while he had another job part-time. And then we started to grow the business. And the first thing I did in the early days was is I'd be working all night and all day. And so I'd come in, open the gym at 5, and I'd close at 11. But if you close at 11, all of a sudden everybody's still in there taking a shower, working out. They don't get out of there until midnight. I'm coming in like quarter to 5 to turn the lights on, and pretty soon I'm not sleeping, and I'm starting to think like four hours isn't enough. So my janitor's there every night. I say, I'll just flip you the keys. You lock up. You open up. 
And my janitor keeps telling me that people are knocking the door at three. Wow. And they're not leaving until one. And I said, well, maybe just stay open all night. Yeah. Maybe there's a bunch of people want to come in at night. So I hire a kid at the time working for me, and he comes, becomes my night guy. And this kid actually worked for me forever, worked his way all the way up the organization, still good friends with him, a kid named Dave Atencio. So he's in high school at the time. He becomes my night guy working graveyards as he goes into college. And 24 Hour Fitness is born. We don't close. That's incredible. So, so you got how many gyms now at this point? Probably we're sitting at about six at that time. And if you went out to the banks and said, we're making a ton of money, they wouldn't loan you a penny because the fitness industry had a terrible reputation. Right. And so we had a hard time raising capital. So really, we just grew from the cash flow of the profits of our business. And 10 years later, you know, early 90s, I'm sitting on 32 locations, probably doing around 50 million in sales and about 90 million of profit. And I can remember going distinctly, Leonard and I going into a bank with an amazing presentation, asking for a $2 million line of credit, and they threw us out. Jesus. It's like, wow. This business isn't worth investing in. That's incredible. And so we end up having a hard time raising capital, but we find some groups that want to invest behind us and put, put capital work in. We bring in a couple investors, and then we finally go out and raise a little bit of real money, and then we begin um, acquiring. And... Having spent a lot of time in the industry, going to the industry shows and knowing everybody, there really wasn't an exit back in the early and mid-90s for fitness companies. So all of a sudden I show up, I've got you know tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars I'm raising now, and I'm able to go out there and offer people opportunities to sell. And I start buying gyms and then opening our product in behind them. Mm -hmm. So I was listening to a couple of interviews you did uh, before this one, doing a little research. The one thing I was I thought was very fascinating is how you paid your employees. And you said that was very important to you, that you paid a lot of your managers and, and the, the people who ran the gym salaries that were kind of unheard of in this space. So can you tell me the reasoning behind that and what, you know, what the philosophy was for that? Yeah, great question. I mean, I, I've always felt like I'm not chasing the money. I'm chasing the success. And I want to have the best people that I can possibly find. I want to give them the opportunity to earn as much as possible. And so a gym manager at the time might have made thirty to 50000 And I said, look, if you can perform and the club can be profitable and you can deliver, you can make one hundred fifty, two hundred. It didn't matter to me. And what year is this? In late 80s. That's mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah, wow. people were making, I mean, when we got into the late 90s, early 2000s, a lot of folks were making anywhere from two to 800000 So we paid extremely well with a lot of incentives, and you could earn as much as you wanted. If you wanted to make more, then move up to the next level, go to a district level, go to a regional level go to a presidential level and make, you know, seven figures. Mm -hmm. But we believed if you performed and you were great, then the, the, there's no ceiling to your earning potential. Right. So, so speaking of talent, because I know you, you're you a big proponent of uh, great people, great talent, and, and your business is your people. As we speak today, you have hundreds of people around the world that are kind of master of loyalists. I mean, they just, they're waiting for your next move to put the band together. Two questions, Mark. A, how do you identify great talent? Right? Sometimes you have to do it in a short time. And B, how do you retain them to be loyal to? Some of your people have been working with you for 25, 30 years. Yeah, good, good question. I mean, I, you know, loyalty is something you earn and try and maintain, right? So my view is it's never given. But I'm always very loyal to my people. I do whatever it takes. I, I believe the pyramid's upside down. I work for you. Whatever you need. If it's help, you know, personal help, if it's financial help, if it's anything that's going on in your life, I'm there for you. So I think that most of the folks that have worked with me recognize that and see that, that I'm just going to be right at you, tell you the truth at all times, and uh, support you in the best way I can. I'm also going to compensate you in a big way, right. more, more than probably everybody else, because, I mean, I look at you as my partner. Everybody's a partner, so I want you to do well and perform well and earn well if you can and if you want to. Um, but, you know, globally, you know, the beauty is finding talent and recognizing talent. It's kind of like you're a savant when you mm -hmm. see someone swing the bat or pitch mm -hmm or throw the ball, you can tell in five minutes if they're you know, of quality or not. And I think on my side, it's the same thing, is I have a pretty good knack for being able to identify talent and recognizing good quality in people. And it's, you know, it's like when you're around certain people, you just, they have this charisma. And I always, always say they're the mayor of the town. And when you find the mayor of the town, whether they're 17 year old or 35 year old, you got the right person. And how long does it take you? I mean, they, like for me, if I see a, an athlete walking into the Yankee clubhouse. I usually, sometimes, I'm wrong, but you know, eight or nine times, you, you're pretty within kind of the bucket of, of where you think this person may end up. And sometimes it takes five minutes, sometimes it takes five hours. But for you, how quickly 
Can you identify that talent? And what are the things you're looking for? Is it speaking skills, writing skills? What are the things that jump off the page for you? Yeah, uh, a lot of times it's, it's hard to identify passion, right? You can see talent, physical talent, ability, and intelligence. But, you know, will they put the effort in? Do they have that hunger? But once you get the ability to kind of spend time with people and see all of that, you know, you can recognize it in a few minutes. And then I always believed in giving people the opportunity and saying, hey, it's your opportunity. I'm here to support you and help you. So is our team. But it's your opportunity to go chase after it and get after it. And those that really wanted it did, and they elevated to higher levels. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it took people a couple of years. Sometimes it took them a couple of days. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody was a little bit different. But, you know, we kind of developed a culture that was really caring and supportive and had a lot of training around it so we could teach and develop people. And I used to tell everybody, look, you may not stay here the rest of your life, but everything you learn here, you will apply the rest of your life. And you'll look back and say, you know, these are the, the guiding principles and the, the things that I needed to be successful that I learned here. And uh, I've run into so many people that I've sat down with and they've said, you know, I used to work for you when I was 17. I was <laughs> working for you when I was 26. I worked here. I worked there. You know, I still work for you. But it's just hilarious to see that the, the systems we did put in place and all the training that we did and developed was, was really outstanding. All right. So dumb question here. But knowing that you kind of founded how gyms look today, what was the reasoning like behind how, where you place things, the mirrors, the treadmills, where they are? I'd imagine you had a lot of meetings about that, right? It's still today. We still do like, you know, how everything kind of evolves over time. But, you know, we we did a lot of focus group work. We talked to our staff, our members, and we look at product, competitive product. We travel the globe and see what was out there to try and continually develop and evolve product. And um, mirrors were always ways to make the facility look bigger. Mm -hmm. And then as we got bigger, we cut back on the mirrors because we got too big, almost, you know, made the gym look gigantic. Right. But a lot of it had to do with, you know, the way that we deployed the space. And the beauty I love about the fitness industry is we can take anything and make it work. As long as the ceiling height's decent, you know, it could be second floor, it can be basement, it could be around the corner, it didn't matter. I remember we opened a gym near our office in uh, San Ramon. We were based out there, and I had a space that was an old UPS, about 50,000 square feet. We put a mezzanine in for 20, so it was a 70,000 square foot box. Every single person on my team turned it down. Real estate guys, uh, the president of the division, they said it's a bad location, don't like it. And I just said, no, nah, sorry, guys, I'm overruling you all. It's <laughs> my baby, and if you don't like it, I'll just buy it myself. So I put that gym in, we opened it up. And within two years, it became the number one gym in the company. And I think it was when I left. Wow. wow. I just crushed it. That's crazy. And why? I lived out there. I knew that everybody would find us. Right. Didn't have to be on Main and Main. Right. But we had 400 car parks, and we had this monster facility and had great rent on it, and we just crushed it. So, Mark, you've, you've taught me over the years that, you know, while real estate, I'm sorry, while um, the gym business is a business, you always tell me that it's truly a real estate. It always comes down to the real estate and you can't outrun a bad real estate deal. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, almost all retail is really, you know, where you locate your facility and does it have the staying power because generally you sign 10, 15 year leases and so does the trade area move away from you? And then can you maintain and withstand? Do you have a good parking field? And, and, and competitively, are you in a good location where somebody can't cut off your trade area to the left and somebody to the right? So. Real estate, in our view, is always about 70% of success. Mm -hmm. You know, your operating model, your people, um, the way you get after it, your brand helps on the other side. But you really have to negotiate, spend time on your site selection, your development, and your lease. And if you do good work there, generally, you're always going to perform really well. And you've had that same team for about 25 years or so. Yeah, I've got a, a partner named Mike Feeney who's been... I can't remember how long we've been together now, but uh, who's been doing uh, a lot of the development side. So mm -hmm. he builds and constructs, and he um, spends a lot of time on, on site selection. And then we've got good real estate people like Bill Lawton, who you know, and, and Bill's been working with me for probably 20 years now. And so he just knows what we like, and he mm -hmm. canvasses the area and generally wills it down to the top two or three sites with a lot of logic behind it and, and yeah. facts. I heard you say that uh, after about 10, 15 years, you like to move the gym. Why, that, that seems counterintuitive. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like you move your house, right? You kind of reinvigorate the market. And so we found that when you picked it up and moved it five blocks to the left or right or even half a mile away to a new center and you built a brand new facility, it reinvigorated your member base, your staff, and it reignited the market mm -hmm. again. Because what's really interesting is if you put a 40,000 square foot facility and you're there for 10 years and you're enrolling, call it, let's say it's 3,000 people a year. You know, so you had 30,000 people come and touch that facility. 
you may have enrolled probably one out of every two people in that town. Hmm. Right. So they've come in, they've come out, they've come in, they've come out, whenever they kind of get back and forth. And then you finally move that base over. It, the 20,000 who have left you haven't come back, they all come back. Mm -hmm. They say, hey, they just got a new facility. I want to go check it out. And they go look and they go, it's amazing, I'm in. And all of a sudden you double your member base by that relocation. When you have like spreadsheets of the members and how many you're trying to add every month, do you have a category of people like me who just sign up and forget about it? <laughs> I'm, like I've been a member of 24 hour fitness right here yeah. for like a year. Yeah. I've probably been there three times. Yeah, it's not, <laughs> that's not, we try to focus. It's just an auto. Yeah. I just like, I, they're, they're I, getting I you good then. Yeah. We, yeah, <laughs> they're getting me real good. <laughs> get, how many of the, yeah. how many of me's are out there? There's now? a lot of you's <laughs> out there. There's a lot of you's who carry two, three, four gym memberships. Yes. Now they're, they're hitting, you know, Orange Theory. They're hitting Lifetime Fitness. They're hitting LA Fitness, 25 Fitness, and Crunch. And they're tapping them all, and they're paying everywhere because they want those cards so they can stop and everything. They got their personal trainers. But it's a mental thing, too. But for us, what we did is we made a really early decision in our process that we were going to be consumer-friendly. So we went to no contracts and month to month. Mm -hmm. Like, I think at 24-hour now, they have a contract. You got to lock in. You, you can lock in for a little bit less on your dues for one or two years. We've just been month to month. If you're not working out, you're not happy, then don't don't pay us. Right. Um, we want you in for a bunch of reasons. One is because referrals are the key to our industry. So if you're coming in and telling your friends, then it helps us. Second is if you become what I call a walking billboard where you're in great shape, you look good, you feel Some good, nope. you've lost weight. Everyone's like, what the hell happened? <laughs> yeah. Where are you going? Oh, I'm at, at Crunch. I'm kicking ass, and I love that gym, and everyone follows you. So we want you in. We incentivize you to be in. We try and touch you as much as we can to be in there. That's important to us. But there's a lot of people that go in and out where they just kind of time takes over. Even for me, like, you know, I got four kids. There's weeks where I don't get to train anywhere near what I want to because I'm traveling around chasing my kids and their endeavors. But, you know, it is what it is. Yeah. You, yeah. you talked about the software and how you're a pioneer with, with your team on uh, them billing you every month rather than going to chase people down like 15th of the month and still not getting paid. So it was hard to institutionalize that type of business and really sell at a predictable multiple. But... One of the things that you also pioneered is you did something very popular where, uh, in contrarian at that, at that time, where you brought in a celebrity woman to sit on your board, and that woman was Cindy Crawford. Kind of walk us through why you thought having someone who's such a powerful brand and such an intelligent woman into your board. Yeah, great question. So we were, you know, growing at a rapid pace and becoming one of the, the biggest fitness companies in the U.S. And I felt like we needed someone to represent us and take our brand to a higher level. And so at that time, Cine was one of, if not the biggest model spokespeople in the world. Mm -hmm. So we reached out and spent time with her, got to know her, and we put a deal together with her to become like a spokesperson for us. And then I got to spend a little bit of time with her, and I got to know her as a person. And what I found was she was uber bright. I mean, really bright, like, mm -hmm. you know, beyond what you would ever think for anybody. And she was inquisitive and she loved fitness she loved exercise and so one day I sat down with her I said hey look what do you think about joining our board and she said look I've never done that before why why are you asking me that and I said I just think you'd be great um, I think you have a, a feel for the industry I think you have a feel from a woman's perspective which I think is really important and on top of that you're super smart mm -hmm. so she agreed and and uh, we put her on the board I gave her a bunch of shares she actually even invested mm. I know she did really well with her investment mm -hmm. and she sat on the board for a bunch of years I can't remember how long she was there but she was engaged and she added value and she gave it mm. back to all the board members um, and she was amazing mm. so I, I loved having her yeah so the board meetings, did you guys like ever bench press or anything? Like, <laughs> what did you bench at your heyday? Oh, probably about 325. Really? Yeah. How many reps? Oh, I could probably pound out six to eight pretty quickly. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's, That's decent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, That's let's decent. talk about that because I couldn't lift that much. So <laughs> transitioning. Um, so, Mark, then you thought, okay, let me see if I can merge what I love most, sports, right? And for a long time, you were just single running 24-hour fitness. And, and health and wellness. And you started bringing in athletes to connect with you and brand your gym. So you had Andrew Agassi, Shaq, Magic, Derek. Walk us through that, because that was a very kind of new thought process. Yeah, no, I give the credit to Magic. I got a, I got a call from Irvin, and he said, hey, look, I just did a deal with Howard Schultz at Starbucks, and I want to focus on inner city. And I think that fitness is underserved in the inner city. I want to meet with you and, and do something bringing 25 fitness into the inner cities and so we spent some time together we crafted a document 
And we began opening up these 24 fitness co-branded, you know, Magic Johnson, we call them sport clubs. And I remember we did the first one up in Richmond, California, which is kind of an inner city of the local Bay Area. Um, and we dropped in a beautiful club there and he came up and we opened it. He sat outside for probably six hours and signed mm. every single person's item for autograph. Mm. That's something I, I'm still amazed. Just sat there patiently, talked to everybody, touched everybody. If you were in line, he stayed. Mm. And we built this brand with him. And then all of a sudden, as it became successful, more people started calling, mm. saying, hey, I see you're doing something with magic. I want to do something with you. Can we do something together? And we spent a lot of time vetting it out. Some people we didn't feel fit. And mm -hmm. some people we felt kind of did fit. And where there was a fit, we kind of co-branded. And I liked it because it, it kind of broke us through the clutter a little bit and made our brand out, you know, stand out a little bit more than, than others mm. in the marketplace at the time. And, and it was a lot of fun. Our team loved it. The athletes loved it. It was kind of a hand-in-glove fit. Mm -hmm. At the height, what was, uh, or I mean, what, what was the peak of the amount of gyms you had under 24-hour fitness? Mm -hmm. So when we sold in 05, we had about 420, included, um, we had about that time 24, 25 of them in Asia. So we had a bunch out there. We'd also built, I'd spent three years in Europe. We built, bought, or developed 160 plus in Europe over about a three-year period of time. And then uh, we sold that to Nordic Capital. So that wasn't included in our sale in 05, but you know, we probably developed close to you know, 600 locations. That's crazy. That's a lot of gyms. That's a yeah. lot of gyms. You went to every single one? <laughs> I probably touched everything. I mean, there's probably a few in Scandinavia I didn't get hit. There's some franchises we had way up near the North Pole I didn't get to. But I probably got to everything in Denmark and Sweden, the vast majority of Norway, and then Germany, Spain, wherever we went. But I've touched almost everything I can think of. Yeah. I mean, I always find that fascinating when you scale – like the ability to be in charge of everything and know what's going on. How is that when you, you know, you took it from a baby to, to what it was, 420 gyms. How do you scale and, and have everyone feel comfortable going to sleep at night knowing that someone else is running your baby? Yeah, great, great question too. It's just great people. So we were really fortunate to attract amazing people that we put in key positions um, all over the place. And so in, in acquisitions, like we, we merged or kind of acquired uh, Ray Wilson Family Fitness Centers. And at the time, we had 34 locations. We raised some capital. They had 68. And we, we bought them and brought them in. And they had amazing talent inside there. Uh, there's a kid by the name of Ron Thompson who became a divisional president for me. He, he just for, unfortunately passed away uh, a few months back. Ron was amazing. Mm -hmm. And he led the business. They had amazing people in their back office and marketing. And Ray was phenomenal. Ray was a industry legend. So I got to spend time with, you know, a guy that had done everything that could be done in the industry and pick his brain and learn from him and others. And then we had a homegrown group of guys and gals that we had developed over time who just continually performed at the highest level. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, when you have great people, you go to bed every night feeling good, and if something happens during the night, you wake up and get after it. Yeah. So these new gyms that you have, the um, team-oriented gyms, those are genius because I, like, am a dumb sports fan. I saw <laughs> you have the 49ers, the Cowboys. You just opened the Bears one. Yeah, it And I today. see it. It says train like a bear, and it's like, damn, I want to go work out there. That's speaking of you. Yeah, I want to go work out there and become yeah, a bear. That, that, <laughs> that Bears club, I mean, I haven't been in the found product because we just opened it today. But I'm telling you, that thing is unbelievable. Yeah. That location's crazy. So credit to you for basically, I don't want to say praying, but you did a good job of knowing all, like, the crossover of dumb sports fans like me <laughs> and people who want to work out and be like, man, I feel like a real football player. You just put turf out there. Yeah. Just put the so turf and all the tools. So you do every team? Uh, I don't think every team. that We're talking to a lot of them, and, and uh, we're getting ready to open a couple more, but it's just been a really fun project because we started with the, the Cowboys, with the Jones family, and, and Jerry Sr. got it right away, and, and Stephen and Junior and Charlotte got right in behind it, and we spent a couple years developing something from the ground up, and we built this product out there that's off the charts. But what was really cool is that you get to work with one of the legendary NFL owners, right. one of the geniuses around marketing and sales, and, and his daughter, who's the same, and Stephen and Junior, and all of a sudden you're learning you know, I love learning. So I'm sitting with the Cowboy franchise in rooms with people that are, you know, managing billion-dollar budgets, and you're getting to hear a little bit of what they're doing, how they're doing it, what's working, what's not working, and you pick up a lot, and you can apply it to everything you're doing in life, which is just the fun part of business. Yeah, absolutely. So, Mark, you know, we're in New York City here, and some of the smartest 
greatest, most hardworking people live right here in their city. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't say Chicago. <laughs> well, but, I live here now. Uh, yeah, that's so, true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I was talking about others. But yeah. anyways, <laughs> um, you know, you have obviously some of the great uh, investors, uh, people that deploy billions of dollars every year. Uh, they run big hedge funds, private equity groups. And then on the right side, you have some great operators and people that go out and execute in the front line. To me, the thing that I've marveled at, you know, being a friend of yours and how you operate your business, you're actually both. You understand kind of left side of the brain, right side of the brain. One, which one do you enjoy more? And B, how can you be good at both? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm good at both, but I, you know, I'm the kind of person like you, and you're the same way because we spend a lot of time together mm -hmm. that you want to master everything you possibly can. Mm -hmm. um, people look at you as an amazing athlete. Mm -hmm you know, not even a baseball player. I mean, you could have been a star quarterback probably in the NFL mm -hmm. instead. If you wanted to be, your choice could have been a scratch. You are a scratch golfer, but I mean, you're a scratch he, golfer. No, he's being he, he was. He can be whenever he wants to be. He hits the ball further than anybody I've ever met. I can tell you stories where he's hitting guys in the head on the other side of the range. They're pissed off. Like, who the hell just hit that bomb? But, but, um, you're also the most inquisitive business person I've ever mm -hmm. known. I mean, this guy will sit and pick everyone's brain with mm -hmm. really intelligent questions. So, for me, it's it's a little bit of my early days when I sat in that gym and I had to be programming in, in the software, but then running the business at the same time. You kind of have a balance between everything. You want to know A through Z. And I'm really inquisitive. I like to learn. I really like to listen, and then try things and put things to work. And you yeah. read everything. Yeah, I do. I'm, yeah, I'm How like much you. you. Read? A lot. A lot. <laughs> like, and I a... listen to, I podcast listen now, yep. right? Because it's better than reading. So you can have someone in your ear all the time. Uh, my wife loves podcasts. I mean, literally, I go up to the room and I'm talking to her for 10 minutes. And I really shouldn't hear a word I said because she's got the <laughs> earphones in and she's listening to the podcast. Like, Did you hear anything I said? She's like, what, you're talking to me? Yeah. I'm like, oh, God. You're like my kids now. <laughs> Head down. I can't trust I'm even being heard. Yeah. But, but yeah, I, I, I've always been a voracious reader and I just love knowledge. Yeah. That's, I mean, I, I need to read more. That's on my list of things. And go to the gym. Um, we'll fix that. Can we talk about the Kings real quick? So yeah, you sure. are part of the ownership group for the Kings. Uh -huh. And I, 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 we talked briefly before the show started, but I'm always curious, a team like the Kings, with the way the NBA is going now, and it feels like free agents just go to the main cities, what is the plan for a team like the Kings that isn't in a major market and how to compete you guys had a great year. I mean, it was a bounce back year. It felt like the Kings, they have a lot of young talent. But what's that next step? How do you guys take that next step? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, it, 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 I'll put the pressure on Vladi. I mean, he's got to recruit free agents that fit our system. And now that we signed Luke to come in and coach, I mean, everyone's like, oh, they're going to try and be the Warriors, you know, but I don't know that we want to be the Warriors. Everyone tries to be the Warriors. Yeah. It's like, well, they have two of the best three point shooters of all yeah. time. And, and, you know, you look at Houston right now, the Houston looks – like their system pretty good too. you got one guy who dominates the ball and you got guys around him who are amazing like Chris Paul. But I think for us, you know, we've got to find some kids that fit our system. we got to stay young. I, I think the NBA is a young man's game. I've always felt that. And then there's a few guys who break through long term, the, you know, the Currys, the Durants, the Hardens and others that can play for a long period of time. But you need to be young and vibrant and you got to have guys that can shoot the three ball now. And you got to be long and athletic and you got to be able to run the floor. So it's the game's changing, and in the years ahead, it's going to be a bunch of seven footers that can shoot the three, mm -hmm. you know, run like you know up and down like uh, like Fox can run for us, and really get after it. But I think we're a couple pieces away. Uh, I think Vladi's doing a great job. I think the the ownership group's really happy now, and I, I think next year, if we fill a couple pieces, we've got a pretty good uh, chunk of free agency money on uh, set aside. We, we should be pretty relevant next year. Where do you sit when you go to games? On the floor? I, you know, again, my style, you figure it out in two minutes. I sit next to the visiting bench. Okay. <laughs> so I've got floor seats right next to the visiting bench. Um, and I just love to listen to the coaches and learn. And so I, I used to be a Warriors guy my whole life, and I had the floor seats next to the Warriors visiting bench. So a lot of people didn't like that ticket. I love that ticket because I get to see every team coming in. I get to see how they prepare. I see how the coaches coach, how they talk to their team, what the teammates do. And it, and it just fascinates me to see, you know, 29 other teams and, and how they rock. Wait, so when did you buy into the Kings? 13. 2013. So you basically were a Warriors fan all your life. Then you all my bought life. A, a NBA team and and can't root for one of the craziest runs of all. Yeah, time. I I was. Does that hurt? The, yeah, I was in the final group bidding on the Warriors. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know I lost out to Joe and those guys. God bless Joe. He did a great job, and um, I decided to wait and see if I could find another team that I could potentially own, and ended up going up into Sacramento, and uh, had a lot of fun up there. A lot of learning, and the beauty up there is we. 
we bought a team, but we also are more of a real estate developer. We built our own stadium. Um, the interesting fact a lot of people don't know is when we did the deal and we were able to keep them in Sacramento, David Stern made it very clear to us that we had to build a new stadium within three years. Mm. And if we didn't get that done in three years, you could take the team back from us wow. and relocate it. And all the capital we put to work in that three years, whether it was two or $300 million, if we didn't get it done, we didn't get it back. Right. Wow. So we took this huge risk. And I spent a lot of time, and it was an issue with Ron Burkle, who's going to be our original partner. Ron Burkle and his team and I spent a ton of time acquiring that 12 acres we bought downtown and then turned that into our stadium. And then we put in a hotel and mixed-use retail. And the, the group that's in there now running everything has done a phenomenal job. Yeah. You know, so, Mark, there's also, um, and I know this because Jennifer's going to go perform this summer in your arena. Yeah. Um, tell us a, a few of the things you did to make it friendly, not only for the fan base, but the cashless thing, and also what you did for some of uh, your players, just kind of, you know, locker room and some of the stuff. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the fun thing is is that, hey, you're now an NBA owner and you got to go spend $550 million and build an arena, buy some property and, you know, mm -hmm. come out of your pocket in, in a deep way. And so the first thing you do is you go around the NBA and see what everybody else is doing. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of teams are, are really kind in hosting us and bringing us into their venues and telling us things that we should or shouldn't do. And then you get into debate what you do. And I remember one of the big debates was practice arena, something as simple as that. And a lot of people felt like you needed to have it with your arena versus 10 miles away. And when you got into conversation, why would that be? They would say, it's simple as this. Players are going to tell you that I drove to the arena, but the practice was at the practice facility and vice versa. When reality is they're still at home. Mm -hmm. So you need to be in the same spot to eliminate that excuse because it's bigger than you think. Right. Um, you need to be close by. So before the game, because you can't get on the court sometimes, you have a place right there that you can come out of the locker room and put in a couple hours of shooting if mm -hmm. you want. And you want it all self-contained. So you'd spend time on that and, and you'd make a decision that maybe was 30 or $40 million to build a practice arena, which is crazy, but you had to have it. Yeah. And then you looked at how you built your stadium. Do you want hockey and basketball or just basketball? Because hockey mm. changes the configuration and the seating, <clears throat> and it's not quite the experience that basketball gets with that whole venue. And how big do you want your bowl? The most expensive seat to construct is the one all the way at the top, which is the cheapest ticket you sell. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then the NBA wanted us to put 20,000 seats in initially, and we went back to them and said, we really think 17.5 is better. We think a smaller arena fits the market and, and is easier for us to sell concerts and basketball than 20,000, and they, and they eventually agreed with us. But thousands of man hours in the development, and, and the ownership group was heavily involved, and, and we had a, a guy that we brought in from the NBA named Chris Granger, who worked for us, did an amazing job along with all the partners. Mm -hmm. um, all right, do you want to do some, I have some dumb questions for you. Okay. All right, um, and I have a couple ideas that I'm gonna pitch <laughs> you. You got it. Uh, first thing, what can we do about the uh, old naked dudes that walk around in every locker room in the gym? <laughs> Well, you ever have a discussion about that? Like, yeah, I mean, it's it generally you make sure you have towel service. So yeah, they're wrapped up well. <laughs> yeah, um, make sure there's no cameras because there's no camera rule inside there. Yep. But you have to appreciate one day you're going to be that old naked dude. True. And you got to look at that guy and say, can I look as good as him or can yeah. I look better than him? Yeah, true. And then you use your 25 fitness membership and you're feeling good about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, there is definitely a point where everyone will reach an age where it's like, hey, this is now the time where I can just walk around a locker room completely naked and not care. It, yeah. It, it, it's <laughs> Every kinda, gym has it. Yeah, it's kind of like comedy, right? You know, when, when uh, you're listening to different people talk about how their feet look in a mirror. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> right, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, grunters and groaners, you ever talk about that? People who are too loud? Yeah, I mean, uh, there are some gym chains that don't allow it and they throw you out, and there's some gym chains like Crunch that somewhat, you know, open to everything. They have no judgments. Uh, you don't hear it as much as you used to. For some reason, it kind of came out of vogue, and... 20 years ago, people grunted a lot when they lifted yeah. weights. But now they're pretty quiet, not like it was. And I think maybe some of it came from the Pumping Iron movies with Arnold where people saw them grunting, mm. thinking that gave you a better rep. Yep. Uh, but I think now everybody's kind of pretty quiet about their exercise. What about um, treadmills that the headphone jack never works? I feel that's, like that one sucks. in every three head, uh, yeah. treadmills has that. No, that sucks. Yeah. We've, we kind of have fixed that now, the treadmill industry, less than us. But you know what it was from? perspiration sweating uh, mm. and it got into the jack and you plugged it in after about two or three hundred of those that pretty much started frying those things out so they've fixed all that 
it's pretty good now. Now you can go wireless, whatever you want to do. Yep. I mean, the Apple Watch now, you can literally go onto the treadmill and click on your Apple Watch. It'll download your whole workout onto the watch or onto wow. your phone. So you can control all that. Yep. So there Apple's doing a, a ton of cool Apple stuff. Watch. Yeah, Apple yeah. Watch. They're doing some cool stuff. Um, all right. A couple ideas for you. So I've always thought that the hardest part about going to the gym is like I have other things that I hate doing during the day that I have like my commute sucks, right? Why not be able to go to the gym during it? So I've always thought maybe buy a bunch of moving trucks and put the treadmills in the back and have people be able to run on a treadmill while it takes them to work. Yeah, as long as it's steady, I mean, it probably could work. Pretty good idea. Yeah, it's good idea. What about idea. planes? Put a treadmill on a plane. We, we've talked about trying to do that in really? the past. Yeah, we had, we had some conversations. Um, when I was building 24-hour, we had a BHAG, right? You know what a BHAG is? No. It's called a big, hairy, audacious goal. Okay. It's a goal that you can't achieve, but something you dream about. And at 24, the BHAG we had was to put um, a gym on the space station. Okay. And that was our goal. So we spent a lot of time with NASA trying to figure out how we could help put exercise into the space station. And where did it lead to? We never finished. It was too big a goal. I mean, NASA, we had conversations, talked about it. They did some small stuff, but we wanted to put like a real gym there. We yeah, could work yeah. out and see what would happen in space. Would you get muscle mass, not get muscle mass? Yeah. We were trying to get some in, um, universities to underwrite it thinking about dropping something on the moon one day, but we wanted something that was crazy that you couldn't achieve, then we would push really hard to try and achieve it. So you're saying my idea is not that bad. <laughs> it's not that bad. I think it's doable. I think potholes is a big problem. Potholes is a big problem for the, mm -hmm. the driving the trucks. That'd yep. be steady. Yes. You gotta have a rope on there in case you hit a bump and you kind of go side to side. Yes. Yeah. But good. I mean, you just combine the things you hate and make it, cause like, I don't want to waste time going to the gym and also commuting, put them together. Boom, I'm jacked. Yeah, no, good work. Okay, good work. Uh, and then my last idea, have you thought about 25-hour fitness? <laughs> thought about it, but you know Ben Stiller in Something About Mary, you know, True. He, he got that six-minute ab thing going. Hold I kind of scared about it. Hey, here's my idea, though. You build a gym <laughs> right on like the border of uh, the time zones in Indiana. Yeah. So one half is on East Coast time, one half <laughs> is on Midwest time. And you can go back and forth 25 it, hours. It could work. We, and we had a thing at one time where we were on every continent just about. And right. So literally you could go around in a day and train everywhere and finish up doing at least 25 hours. Okay. Maybe more. I'm just thinking. It's like yeah. you always got to one-up yourself. That's 25 right. 25-hour fitness would be genius. I got it's, it. It's asking Alex, I mean, how many home runs more would he have hit if he'd have bat left-handed? 25-hour. Oh. That's right? true. Right. How many would he hit left-handed? Left lefty? No. Okay. <laughs> In my mind. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so I got a, I got a couple more, Mark, and I know uh, thank you for your time. It's been absolutely incredible. Um, <clears throat> one of the things you've always talked to me about and, and coached me on is, you know, with your experience that for young listeners and older listeners, um, people that want to go on and take on the world, you've always said, Alex, don't go wide and shallow, go narrow and deep. And that's basically how we actually try to run A-Rod Corp every day. Explain to our listeners what you mean by that. Yeah, so I, I mean, I learned a long time ago, you can only do so many things well. And by trying to, to tackle too many things, not giving it enough time and attention, it's kind of like a shallow approach and you get pretty wide. You're trying to do 50 things at one time and none of them really work out and you keep wondering why you're failing. And then what you do is you step back and you realize that you're really good at two or three things. And you just learn it all the way up and down the channel and you get it right. So you're narrow and deep and you're really focused and you're driven and you master it. And then you perform. And you get really great at something, whether you use the 10-hour, 10,000-hour theory or 10 years, whatever you want to talk about, you really get great at it. And so my belief has always been do something really, really well and not something half-ass. Mm -hmm. And so I try not to get get too wide, too shallow. And I've always felt like I'm, I'm narrow and deep and I'm going to make people proud about what the work is that I'm doing and the work I'm doing with you so we get, get it right. Now, some people have the ability to go really shallow and wide and perform. And there's a handful that can do it, but I'm just not one of those guys. And I haven't seen many that can. And, you know, for you and for others and for young people today, your brand is what you're all about, especially when you get into social media now. I mean, if you can put 500,000 people on your social media following list, you're probably making a million dollars a year mm. in endorsement deals. And if you can get to two or three million, you're, you're making incredible money in today's world. That may change, but in today's world. So your brand is really important. And the last thing you want to do is go out there and do something half ass and destroy your brand in a minute. And after all you've done that good work, kind of been building it to the point it's at now. So I, I got to tell you, I mean, uh, Big Cat, one of the things I can tell you, 
from personal experience with dealing with Mark with so many things and being able to learn to him kind of parallel uh, and, and, and together with him is whether he's doing these billion dollar deals with the Sacramento Kings and building new stadiums or, you know, selling, uh, you know, these companies like 24 Hour Fitness for almost $2 billion or doing a deal for 50 or $100,000, he goes after it the same exact way, tenacity, fierce, and also detailed oriented, which, which has been a great lear learning experience for me as a young entrepreneur. Uh, Mark, I, I want to just shift real quick to baseball because that's besides my family and my two beautiful girls um, is my number one love is baseball. And if you were commissioner, I know what a big fan you are of baseball and you watch Sundays and you always give me great feedback. Uh, commissioner for one day, what are the two or three things that you would do to kind of connect to the next generation and to grow the game domestically and globally? Yeah, great, great question. Well, first, I'd, I'd make you commissioner instead of me. <laughs> That'd be a lot better <laughs> answer than I'm going to give. But I, I do think that you can bring a lot of technology into everything that's going on today that kids want to sit there. I want, I want to know before you come up the bat what you're thinking, what you're mm -hmm. going to do, what pitch you might be looking for. I want to hear what the catcher's doing. I want to hear what the pitcher's doing. I want to know what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so I have a better understanding of the game within the game mm -hmm. because once I had a chance to spend – hours with you listening mm -hmm. about how you think about baseball just turn my whole head sideways from the way I would look at it. Mm -hmm. So I, I really think it needs to be a little bit more interactive and a little bit more open. Mm -hmm. um, when the outfielder's out there, why is he moving into a certain position? You know, why is everybody shifting to the right? What, what's going on within the game? I, I want to hear from the players on the field mm -hmm. in a big way. And then the, the other piece is I just want more fan involvement. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, like even in basketball, but like baseball, I'd love to say, okay, it's a three and two, and I'm going to ask the fans what pitch to throw. <laughs> and they're all going to vote. It's going to be a slider. It's going to be a sinker. It's mm -hmm. going to be a fastball. It's going to be up and in. What is it going to mm -hmm. be? And I'm going to let the fans do it. That's dangerous. See they do it. Yeah. Because I would, like, go for it on every fourth down. Right? <laughs> yeah. That stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You should. Never punt. Never punt. Never, ever punt. Yeah. But then the fan, you, the coach can say, hey, I didn't make the call. The fans did. Yeah, and it true. wasn't the right call. It was like Nick Saban. Did you see Nick Saban the other day? Mm -mm. He had his uh, spring game, and he let the media be the coaches. Wow. And his, his top team with Tua, I think they call it the white team, they lost. And so he came up to the podium. He's like, hey, I, I, I want to ask you questions like you asked me. What the hell were you thinking? Why did you run that play? Oh, man. And I just think if you could, you could take the game and make the game within the game a little bit easier for kids today to understand. Mm -hmm. Because I've had, I have three boys. And my daughter, they all played baseball. My daughter even played baseball. Mm -hmm. And my first two boys fell out of love with it because of how slow it is. Mm. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't get over that hump because today everything's happening so fast. My, my third guy loves baseball. Mm -hmm. Something that Alex did to him when he was five years mm -hmm. old. He sat there and showed him how to swing the bat. And ever since then, he's just been locked. And mm -hmm. he, 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 he can hit a baseball kid. He can hit. Yeah, he just loves baseball. But, you know, a lot of kids I see in our community just stop playing. It just it gets, slows it down. So... Something has to happen to bring kids in to understand the game within the game would be something I would do. <clears throat> and then probably I'd say as commissioner, I'd say every ticket's free today and mm -hmm. everybody can come to the game for free and pack the stadiums. Like once a month yeah. or something? Once a month and pack the stadiums, the upper bowls, whatever it is, mm -hmm. and you'll make your money in your parking and your food and your beverage and you'll create fans and kids will want to come back and you know do all the things that you've been doing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think – Baseball has improved dramatically, and I think it has a lot to do with the way that you explain baseball mm. on the nights that you're on television for all of us. Thank it you. It changes the game. And for me, sitting there, like almost every game you say something, I'm like, holy shit, I didn't know that. Mm -hmm. You know, just like when you did, you know, I think it was Bryce Harper last year, and he was mm -hmm. struggling at the plate, and you saw something in his mechanics and pointed out to him. The all whole sudden breathing he went, thing. He went like three for three. Mm -hmm. Like as soon as you told him, it was like just simple things like that that none of us see or understand. Mm -hmm. Let's share it. Let's let the fans hear more. Certainly more sharing. You should be a manager someday so I can live my dream of being a bench coach. If you own a team. I want to be one of those guys. Maybe you can hire me? me. No, just the guy who sits there and you just ask me every now and then, should I do this? And I'm just like, sure. <laughs> he and just says, pick up, the, pick up the phone and call yeah, on the left. Yeah, the clubhouse guy, right. That's what we got to do. Let's aspire like to do that. Spit seeds like on TV for an hour, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, all right, Mark, thank you so much. Hey, my this pleasure. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, good luck to the Kings. Thank you. Good luck to your esports team as well. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're crushing it right now. Yeah. We are crushing it. Yeah. Are you guys uh, going for the chance? I don't know anything about it. Well, and, yeah, we're young. NRG, we've got guys all over the across the board, but our, our shock team is uh, just on fire. Okay. So we are, we're crushing it. We look good. Do all you the play? Great. 
I play with my sons, yeah. Okay. But I'm not good. They yeah. kick they kick my ass. That's but okay. I enjoy it. Yeah, it's yeah. good. I mean I play every now and then. I yeah. get it's absolutely fun. Absolutely killed. Well yeah, Mark, fun. I'm excited for our listeners to hear this. I've been hearing it for over a dozen years. I am thrilled to have you on our podcast. Our our, our listeners are gonna love it. And listeners, if you get a chance to follow Mark, follow him, read about him. I cannot wait for you to write a business book. Get I'm a Twitter be right. account. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm pretty low profile. Yeah, you're nowhere to be found. So maybe start there. And then yeah, I let my kids do all the talking. <laughs> let them get after it. Yeah. 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 All right. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate right. it, guys. Thank you very much.